Okay, welcome back. Um, we'll quickly go through um, what, you know, how Christian counseling can help, and then maybe we'll try and do a role play. Okay? Because I think just to just for us to be able to get into that that place of knowing how to respond, uh, what to say. Okay. Um, the uh, so so you know you even when people come to you, those who are abused, there may be many kinds of people in many situations that they come. People who've been abused as children and uh, have never sought any kind of an assistance or help and then they come for healing, right? Or there can be people who've, who've been through different sets of counseling, support, but want to have continued support. People who may be undergoing abuse then and there, right? So there are these three categories of people who, can, who may come to you. Um, now, after you've done what we spoke about last week, I'm sorry, this last class, about how you're there, you're available, you don't dismiss, you believe what they have said, listen to their entire story, get them to a place of safety, getting support for that. After you've done all of that, we continue come, coming to you. Bringing back hope, right? I think that's one of the biggest things for them, bringing back hope, building trust. That is what is probably most needed. Um, especially, you know, in, in cases where there is a certain male figure or a father figure who's been the abuser, the very concept of who God is begins to uh, be fragmented, right? So to help and to bring them back to a place of healing, to live in that place of hope, to live in the place of trust in knowing that God loves them and God is there to... Uh, restore whatever that is emotionally being lost. If you look at the verse that's put there in, in the beginning, where it, uh, in Isaiah 5, 20, 21, um, you know, it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Now, often what happens when you are working with people who are generally abused, one of the large, uh, one of the um, uh, things that they generally go through is a feeling that they, um, um, they, they deserved that form of an abuse, or maybe they're not good enough to actually have uh, to, they're not good enough, and as a result, they have bought about themselves brought about abuse upon themselves or the fact that they are responsible that it is because of me so that's something that you know may take a long time for them to move away from that understanding that that belief that they are the problem or they were the problem and that's why that abuse came to them so a lot of these um, emotions these emotional struggles are something that they will require time you will require empathy. They will require the word of God to show them and help them experience the forgiveness and restoration that God has for them, being able to, over time, help them to apply God's word. Now, what happens in abuse? Uh, are we all listening? Yeah. What happens in abuse is that there are multiple thoughts that comes about, you know, and especially they are negative uh, condemning, hurtful, uh, depreciating thoughts about themselves. And that's what you want them to identify. You remember the model we spoke about? ABCD model? Remember that? Now, this is very, very much applied in this, in, in issues like this, where they are helped, they see the event has taken place, there's a certain belief that they have. Maybe the belief is that they deserve the abuse or they they uh, you know they brought about all the negative things that's probably the belief and as a result they have certain thoughts that run through that okay so working with them to help them to um, change to take to captive all those negative thoughts so that they can begin to live 
in healing and begin to live in freedom. Now, this is a it's a process. It's not something that may happen as a one off or, or you know, one or two sessions, but it's something that the, you will see as a process. Other things that you, uh, you know, in counseling that you need to deal with is the way that they relate to other people. Often trust gets lost. They, they find it difficult to be vulnerable in, open, in, in close relationships. So helping them build that trustful, rela uh, trusting relationship with other people. So it begins by trusting God in a, uh, from where they are able to trust people. So this becomes a, a journey in itself. And I've just kind of put some of these points because um, it's, it's for you to understand and know. Maybe it's just being open to hear them open to just pray with them, to share God's word, to encourage them. If you're able to do that, that in itself is a, is a wonderful, it's a good thing. OK? All right. OK. Um, so we have two options. We could either move into the second, uh, the next uh, topic, or we can do a role play. What would you all like to do? Uh, question. Ah, yes. Tell me, question. Is a real uh, issue happen? It's a real kind case. of yeah, abuse. Oh. Ah. Um, like it happened because of girls' fault. It it like it is sexual abuse. What happened is like um, they are in relationship. The boy is around twenty five years old. The girl is around sixteen years. So, like we discussed, like below 18 years, there is a sexual abuse. So, because of. Okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, because of this girl, this thing happened. Like she you will. Mean she consented. Yeah. Okay. Then it's not abuse. Okay. It's not abuse if it's they consent. Uh, that was 16 year old, 17 year old. No, so she's 15 years old, 16 years old, kind uh, of. Girl. So, after puberty, if they uh. have consented, it is teenage uh, sexual encounters. So that's not an abuse. But then let's suppose if she can actually go up and, you know, uh, may uh, have a report saying that she was because she's still a minor. But then there, there's, there's been consensus when this. It's consensus. It's consensual sex. That means both have agreed. To have a sexual encounter. Ah, if she doesn't agree, it's a, it's a abuse, of course. So what the uh. Okay. Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No. So what is your question? What happened is actually I'll tell you. Ah. So, so this girl and this boy is in a relationship. This okay. girl is below 18, like I think 16 years old, 15 okay. years old. Ah. And this boy is hmm. 25. 25 years old. Okay. This girl don't know what is sexual relationship, but nothing she don't know. Okay. But this guy came and I don't know, she accepted or what? Hmm. This guy used to come to her house. Hmm. And it became like um, a sexual conduct, and um, it became a lot of issues. So it's an abuser; they can go for any law and order. So that's that's what I'm saying. I don't know. We need to know if it was if if the teenage girl was gave permission, if there was permission or not, right? Because yes, there can be. That's called consensual sex. That is, you you agree to have a sexual encounter. So if it is an agreement, uh, and especially of someone who's like a 16, 17 year old, like above puberty, 14, 15, 16, 17, are all above pu puberty. So they, if it's a consensual sex, it's a, it's consensual sex. It's not abuse if, they've, if she's agreed, right? Others, it's rape. It's a yeah, and it's a ra it's rape. Then it'll be rape. It's sexual assault. It's not abuse. It's rape, and assault. Yeah. 
okay yeah so do you want to do a role play or okay online students it's left up to y'all now your students are your friends are very gracious to leave it to you online students what would you like to do go to so would you like to go i'll take a consensus would you like to go to the next class that is suicide or should we do should we continue on with uh, should we do a role play okay role play there's only one person who said it and i think we'll go with it unless we have <laughs> next class <laughs> next class okay all right okay then we will get into next class okay i just need a minute to to pro to just uh, uh, just put up the presentation just give me a minute Okay, just give me a minute. I need to use both my hands. Okay, <clears throat> we'll um, we'll get to the next one, which is grief counseling. Okay, all right. Okay, so what do we mean by grief counseling? Or let's first look at what the terms are. I've I've presented. I hope you all can see. Yeah. Okay. So what is grief? <clears throat> it is a uh, it's a response to any form of loss. What kind of loss? Financial loss, personal loss, relational loss, uh, uh, death. Okay, so grief can be anything. It just doesn't mean when a person has lost somebody to death. It can mean a loss of a job, loss of a relationship, a natural disaster. All of that is something that can mean grief. And what is bereavement? It is a type of grief that involves the death of a loved one. But you say bereavement when it involves the grief that is involved when someone passes away. Okay. Uh, so grief is, is your emotional response or reaction when something that is very dear to you is taken away and it is a uh, it's a normal response it's a normal reaction to some loss in a person's life it is normal to grieve it is abnormal not to grieve okay so it's normal to grieve okay so when uh, a person is going through bereavement uh, one of the things that you're looking at is how they are coping with death all right and uh, there are four there are four main things that uh, that happens as people cope with someone passing away they have to accept that reality that the person is no more that there is that loss they have to deal with that pain that is process that pain that they go through they need to adjust to a life without having the person with them, the, the loved one with them. And they have to 
maintain a connection to the in memory to the one who has passed away while they move on with life okay so they need to accept the reality they have to work through the pain uh, they need to adjust and they also have to um, uh, have those memories while they uh, move ahead in life so grief can affect people very very differently uh, and it is it's mainly based on the kind of relationship that you have with the person who you lost so depending on how close you are with the person that's how much the the grief would be right if it is a very close a uh, close person the grief would definitely be much more greater than when it is somebody who's distant uh now each person and relationship is different which means that we also deal with grief in a very different way maybe in one uh, uh one person the way that they grieve is the way that they grieve for a particular person may be very different from the way that they grieve for another person also grief can be um uh, it uh, each person experiences grief very uniquely right and it 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 needn't be universal that is for example uh, you know maybe in movies how do they show grief uh, uh, yeah but how yeah maybe huge crying and wailing and beating chest and that's one way of of uh, ex expressing grief but not everyone should need to express like that some may express it silently some may express it more openly whatever there isn't a specific way to express grief okay what are some signs and symptoms of grief the first uh, first thing that you would notice especially when a when there is a loss first is shock right shock and numbness what happened okay okay shock that is there is a uh, there are there is a sense of disbelief something uh, you know how can something like this happen so there's a huge shock there is a sense of numbness that is not able to feel you know what numbness is yeah. what's numbness <laughs> yeah you you lose your sense like when you become numb in your hand you don't sense anything right so there is a there's no feeling absolutely so that's what numbness is there can be thoughts of confusion disbelief uh, and wondering if it's a dream that is a sense of denial right that there is disbelief and wondering if there is uh, 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 if if it's really something that's happened questioning you know why did this happen uh why did this happen to me why did this happen to this person at such a such at such and such age feelings of sadness anger guilt loneliness bitterness fear nervousness lack of confidence all of this there can also be blaming that happens they can um uh they may they may also begin to feel like for example let's say if the person died of an illness they may also say you know i'm also having those similar symptoms of what the person had or if they've been caretaking for a long period of time they begin to experience those same kind of issues and they have problems to function normally um this is a this uh, chart that you can see is um it's something called as a grief cycle all right and it's it's called the kubler ross grief cycle uh the kubler ross grief cycle why is it called kubler ross is the people who who uh, um what do you say bought about this this uh, uh theory is it's named after them okay so it, it's it's named after two people it's a there are uh, there's a psychiatrist by name kubler ross who introduced this and they are the five stages of grief the general five stages of uh, of grief okay so if you look at that the first thing that you can see on the far left side is denial what do you mean by denial okay this denial 
it is actually something that can help you uh, survive that survive that shock right you may not accept things immediately but when you're in that place of denial for a brief period of time your mind or it's like a protective cushion to really uh, help you deal with that loss okay uh, it, that's a time that you may begin to see that you're not in a place of accepting because you're in that state of shock that the person has 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 gone away. Like, for example, if you were diagnosed with, let's say, a dis disease, like, let's say, cancer, right? How do people show denial? They don't show denial? They may say, no, the report is not true. The report is false. Let me go do another checkup to see, right? Like that. Yeah. So then, so then that the I'm, I'm talking about the initial knowledge of that, not after a few few months and all. I don't mean that. The initial hearing of that. No, it can't be. You know, how can I be? I've not had a symptom. There hasn't been like that. It isn't there. Or like when someone dies, how can it be? I just saw the person this morning. We just had lunch together. How can that be? This is this is not. So that that sense of denial of not being able to accept the rea the reality okay so uh, it is a way of protect protection because imagine feeling from this state to having us overwhelming feeling of grief you know suddenly you're just feeling so much of grief so it is a stage that that you know god has just put in so beautifully for us to be able to experience that uh, that sense of sadness right the next stage that you will you will look at is what's the next one anger okay so once the reality strikes in then the anger comes in and even the stage of why me why should this be me life is not fair or you know god's not fair or they they might even begin to look at uh, redirecting their anger to something else so beginning to blame others you know maybe the doctor didn't give him proper proper medication or uh, you know the um, you know his parents didn't bring him up well whatever there are whatever the issues may be right you know there was the bike had a problem and that's why this this happened so all of this tends to tends to ra raise up there where the frustration is so intense it begins to increase all right then comes a place of bargaining what does bargaining mean that is um this for that god if you bring him back for one day if you bring him back then i will do this 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 right a sense of bargaining if only this happened if this changed then i would do this right so that that again becomes a bargaining sorry okay okay so uh, here it's almost like a sense of negotiation that people have you know do this if, if at least a person comes back, then I will I will ensure that I live a better life, right? So that's that's what you see in bargaining. Then comes depression. Depression is um, associated, generally associated with grief, right? Where there there is a slow slow um, understanding of reality and a slow sense of acceptance that this is where it is, this is how it is going to be. So there is that place of feeling extremely hopeless, very overwhelmed at the situation. And lastly, it's a place of acceptance. And this is um, not that, OK, the person has died, but it is saying, yes, the person has died, and I'm going to be OK. I know that you know I will find a way out. That's what the place of acceptance is. So even as you know, we've, we've uh, I've, I've bought about this, um, this, these stages. Um, what's important to see is everyone's not going to go through a linear fashion of this. They can move from denial to anger, and then again they go back to anger. Then they may be, they may be bargaining, then depression. Then again they could go back to bargaining, depression, and then to a place of acceptance. Okay. So in short, this is what generally are the stages of grief and it's normal for people to go through these stages yeah yeah or or with with themselves see make this not happen and in return i will do this like let's say someone's at their deathbed 
maybe at God, maybe to themselves, maybe to whatever they see as a power, whatever, right? Let this not happen. If this happens, or they may make like a, what do you say, a commitment to themselves. If the person comes back, I will stop drinking. I will stop smoking, right? So that's what is called as bargaining, okay? So um, the important thing for us to understand here is what can we do when someone is undergoing grief what is it that you and I can do? So we need to remember that um, when somebody is going through grief, what is the what is the thing that they need the most? What do you think that people need the most? Comfort. Okay. What else? Strengthening. Strengthening. Encouragement. Yeah. Okay. Then. You should not tell them the truth. So what will you say? Sugar coat it, yeah? How? Uh, so tell me how, Anna. Uh. Sorry, come again? They got cancer. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, like that sugar coating you're saying. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay. 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 Uh, no, I agree with uh, with Prince. I agree with Prince. So you don't actually have to tell them which stage they are, and you don't have to say anything. What we can do is build hope. That's what we that's what we're called to do, build hope. But but I think before that, before we get there, um, let's suppose let's look at death. Okay. This too shall pass. This too shall pass. Huh? What happened, Francis? <laughs> That we are also going to die. Is that what he said? No, he's talking about not the person who's dead, the the survivors. That's what he's he's talking to. Huh? Yeah. So very often, I think what what we need to understand, and I've seen this especially among us in church circles, that when someone is grieving, especially you know when someone's lost uh, a loved one, we go and we get very, very scriptural there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he will come back one day. Uh, you, we will all meet again. You know, uh, you just have a few more years to go there. <laughs> all of that is not, at that point, not a comforting thing to do. Huh? And it's not necessary. It's the truth. Yes, it is the truth. But there is a timing for when you say something. Sometimes the best thing to do is what? Just keep quiet. Just listen. Even if even if they are like saying something and they're crying, don't say, don't cry. Come on, you must be strong. Those are all very terrible things to say. Right? Huh? People will die one day. Right? So being sensitive and just being with them. Just your presence is more than important. 
Yeah. Right. So your just your presence is important. That um, you know, weep with them. Weep with those who weep. What did Jesus do at the at Lazarus uh, at uh, Bethany? He wept. He wept, even though he knew he was going to raise Lazarus up. Why did he do that? Yeah. Yeah. To 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 one to demonstrate that death is painful. And people who are his family are pain. So he demonstrated that, right? He comforted us and he showed us. He knew what it was to feel that way, even though he was going to uh, raise up Lazarus. So, so just being there in the presence. So the word translated as comfort in First Thessalonians 4.18 is the word that you use for encourage. Okay, which generally means to be by one's side, be by one's pres uh, uh, you know, to, to be nearby someone. 1 Thessalonians 4.18, the word encourage there. It means parakeleo, which is act comes from the word parakletus, which is helper, as in the sense of Holy Spirit being the helper, which means to be by one side or be by the presence of another. Okay. Uh, so it's also important that they need you to accept what they may be feeling, right? So they may be saying, I'm so pained that it's, 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 I, I feel an uncontrollable sadness. So again, be with them in their feelings, accept them for what you are, what they're feeling rather than saying, like it says, uh, oh yes, you can, don't talk like that. You're going to be okay. Uh, you, you need to be strong for your children, for your family. All of that are um, dismissing whatever they may be feeling. Okay, You can provide comfort, but like it says here, you can't take away their suffering. You can give comfort, but they are the ones who are suffering. So join alongside with them to suffer with them. Okay, Remember, one thing that you can do is offer assistance especially physical assistance like getting them food you know ensuring that there are some uh, what do you say uh, logistical things that may need to be done for the funeral for the uh, for all of that you know helping them physically at that point of time will be a great deal because they're not in a frame of mind to actually work on uh, some of those things okay yeah What who has to do? What would you what would I do? I, if, if a person is not related to me, I would ensure that the family members sit with the person. And someone in a deathbed is not going to be conscious enough to have a conversation. Right? Because if they're breathing their last, they're in a, indefinitely in a, what do you say, they're not mentally alert. No, they may be conscious, but they may not be mentally alert to hear you saying anything. So the best thing at that point of time, which is something you know I've I've done, is just either read scripture, sing, sing songs, uh, sing worship, just helping them move from one part to another. Maybe at that point of time you can't counsel. <laughs> Yeah, maybe that's not a right time to speak, especially when someone's at their deathbed. Right? The the support that and and usually when people, I mean, I'm considering when when you're saying someone is at their deathbed, they are that ill that over the last few weeks, few days, they've slowly, you know, all their capacities have also failed. You're not talking about someone, you know, who. Hmm. Okay, uh, like saying a salvation prayer. You can do a salvation prayer. 
yeah provide again you'll have to look at the circumstance of it i've i've heard of someone who said a salvation prayer to someone it was my friend's uh, um, uh, friend's father so he was on his deathbed he was slightly conscious so she she said she was she was a believer of her parents her parents aren't so she asked she said uh, she did not she said that i'm going to say a prayer uh, um, of salvation you know if you accept jesus you you know we can see each other in heaven you know you will uh, he's there to forgive forgiveness of your sins and if you accept salvation you will go to him right and we will be able to see each other not that he responded but she prayed and uh, she said amen and in faith she said i believe my father has has responded to that call so yes please do that sorry uh so so i mean we i know we put god in a box right some things i believe we should do by faith we do by faith like like this this friend of mine she did it by faith not that her father said anything or said yes or none of that but he was conscious he was listening she said there were tears flowing down from his eyes so she said that was that was my indication that was her indication that probably he did so it's just through faith okay all right um so what are some practical ways that you can help uh, oh sorry i was back to the okay we spoke about this what can you do they need your presence uh, you are to call to comfort and encourage and be at one side during a loss we spoke about that they need your sensitivity so accept the reality of those feelings and emotions and uh, do not judge or push them to you know be he to heal their pain just be uh, just provide that comfort and uh, be there practical assistance as we said being of practical support during the time of their grief okay how how are the other ways to help visit those who are bereaved they need to see and feel that they aren't alone and have support and concern of others so this is after all of you know everything is over the the months the weeks and the months that follow right how you can actually just be alongside with them you know that they aren't alone and they have support of others um be swift to hear slow to speak slow to react to words and feelings saying nothing is better than saying hurtful things okay so just being there to listen sometimes they they may have questions and it's good to have a discussion about questions right about about people and their questions um the best thing is don't try to explain everything maybe there are some things you may have to say i'm not too sure i don't know uh i i have no idea or you know maybe we can discuss or talk to somebody else about this uh it's good to say that express your support and concern by being there by a handshake or by a hug avoid saying i know how you feel you will never know how they feel okay uh but give them a chance to talk about their loved loved one it's good to talk about bring memories of the loved one i think often we feel scared if we if they talk about that person who's passed away the grief will be more it is good that they will talk about like for example they let's say you met them they uh, you know you've gone somewhere and they've come you could say something like uh, i'm sure such and such person would have loved to be here too isn't it and then you you get them to talk and they probably will cry but that's okay that's a process of of grief okay do not rush them to get better or play down their grief okay be patient with that mourning process and uh, lastly it is continue to give them the support that they need visit them often and continue to support them okay all right okay any questions
there are if you look through your notes uh, there are some you know some uh, scripture also that actually helps you uh, to build upon these ideas of how we can be more mindful right about the way that we deal with people who are in pain okay any thoughts any questions Nothing. Ask the question on the mic, no, so people can hear. Yeah. What if the person who lost someone is not moving out from that place? Like it's not just, but if been years or months, but if that person is still in grief, not coming out. So, uh, that's a good question. So there is something called as a normal grief, and normal grief generally um, extends between six months to nine months. Okay, that's called normal grief. There's something called as pathological grief, which is much over that period of time. Let's say beyond a year, if someone continues to grieve as significantly as they did earlier, then they may need help because probably it's moved into depression. And so they may need medical assistance, medical help. That's what we call as pathological grief. That means grief that is not normal, but grief that is disease-like or pathological-like. So that's something that they may need support and help with. If they're not able to move forward, if they're not able to do things as previously, um, then they, they will require help. Okay? All right. If there's no questions, we'll close with a word of prayer. Radha, can you please pray? Here. Father God, we thank you for this time. Thank you for this day. And uh, whatever we learned from this class, you help us to uh, be the comforter when people are going through such kind of situation. And... Um, we surrender everything into your hand, God, and um, you help us, you guide us by your Holy Spirit, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.